We have lots to talk about in today's video, including some trade talk around the Maple Leafs, the Senators, and the Sabres. Plus, we have more news from the NHL waiver wire on Vili Husso and Alex Barré-Boulé. Plus, we have uh, Devils nutminder Jake Allen made history today. Some more injury updates. We had one heck of a wild game this afternoon between the Senators and the Los Angeles Kings. We'll get into all the details and news and rumors coming up next. Well, welcome back to another video here at Top Shelf Hawk. As I mentioned, as you can see, we're kind of still in the makeshift uh, uh, TH8 studios here. Uh, obviously, we'll hopefully get back to our normal spot here tomorrow. Just got a lot going on here at home on Thanksgiving weekend. And my uh, studio has been a little bit um, less accessible than we'd like to say. Um, so, unfortunately, we're, uh, like I said, just going with the makeshift here uh, for today. Hopefully back to normal tomorrow. News from the waiver wire. Uh, we had two players on waivers, including Montreal Canadiens forward Alex Barré-Boulet. And Red Wings netminder Vili Husso, who was much more of the surprise um, addition to that list of players on waivers yesterday. Both players cleared. Neither one I was picked up. They can both be reassigned. I know in the case of the Red Wings, they needed to recall a forward um, due to some injuries and whatnot, and they needed some space. And, you know, with Husso's play not being great at the start of the year, he unfortunately is the guy that took the fall, so he can be reassigned now, and uh, we'll see what they decide to do. But certainly, the Red Wings have three goaltenders. Uh, Talbot's had a good start so far. Alex Lyons in the mix. I don't think Billy Husso, who's going to finally give his contract, has a long history in Detroit. And as I mentioned in yesterday's video, talking about the waivers in the first place. Uh, now that he's clear, just because he wasn't picked up on waivers, it's not an automatic given here that he doesn't get traded, because um, clearly. Uh, players who have cleared waivers do give other teams more flexibility when picking them up. So we'll see what happens. But Billy Husso um, can be reassigned, and it's not a given that he won't get moved eventually here because Detroit doesn't really have a lot of room salary cap-wise and cannot really benefit from carrying three goaltenders. Uh, tonight marks the debut of the NHL on Prime Monday Night Hockey in Canada. Uh, the game is going on right now as I record this video is Pittsburgh versus Montreal. Seems like a pretty good broadcast here so far. I know I mentioned before, uh, I personally have been an Amazon Prime subscriber for a long time. I've had a Prime membership for a few years. So um, for me, it's nothing additional and I wasn't already uh, paying. Um, so to, to get the games on Prime for me is um, and basically not a bonus. It's not a big deal. But uh, between what Amazon has done with NHL Faceoff series, which I'd recommend you check out, really great behind-the-scenes footage there um, with all the players that they followed around last season. And then, of course, with this uh, debut tonight, I, I give the, the broadcast good credit, like um, good quality programming so far. Certainly better than what you're going to see on Sportsnet in Canada. And then at the same time, uh, we have Thursday's Coast to Coast show kicks off later this week week as well uh, where you're going to be able to kind of surf around and get all the you know you're going to jump around from game to game get all the commentary um, you know similar to what they do with the NFL so certainly you know very um, unique programming and certainly something that we're probably going to have to get more used to I know based on comments from Gary Batman he said based on the the lack of reach in like the cable world now when the NHL rights package in Canada comes up which is not all that far away you know, look for streaming um, places like Amazon to be very much in the mix. I do think we'll still see uh, uh, outlets like Sportsnet and TSN carry a bunch of games. I know TSN is very much a regional broadcaster, um, but they will be in the mix for sure. I think Amazon is just starting to get into the sports world and will slowly become a major player um, throughout it uh, for already. So we'll see what happens. But uh, debut tonight of NHL and Prime. I give it a thumbs up so far. Uh, Jake Allen, uh, goal to course, somebody who I hold very high as a you know favorite NHL player, given that we share a hometown. Uh, my hometown of Fredericton, New Brunswick, has not produced a ton of NHL talent, um, but Jake is one of our uh, local heroes that have been able to not only make the NHL, but bring a Stanley Cup home as well. And he made history tonight. Uh, he actually became um, the first goaltender uh, in NHL history to record a win against 33 different teams. Of course, the uh, Devils beat Utah tonight. They shut them out earlier today, uh, three to nothing. Uh, so he picks up his first win against the new franchise in Utah. Gets a shutout to boot, which is even better. Um, and because that's the 33rd different team that he's beat, he's the first goalie to ever do that. I mean, obviously during his time in the NHL, we've had 32 franchises before this year. Um, obviously he's played with St. Louis, he's played with Montreal, now he's played with New Jersey, and he's picked up wins against all those teams during his tenure as well. So, uh, yeah, with, with Arizona going to Utah, 
That now makes 33 different teams have been in the league during his career, and he has at least one win against all of them. So uh, Jake Allen makes history in that sense. Now that Utah, because that's Utah's first loss, so it's the first goalie to pick up a win against them as well. Now that that's happened, of course, as Utah, you know, they will eventually lose more games. They're not going to win them all. Um, other goalies that have uh, wins against all the other teams will eventually get down. I'm sure there'll be uh, other goalies joining Jake here throughout the NHL season. But just a cool piece of NHL history. Uh, some injury updates from today as well. I know during that game, Sean Dersey left the game for Utah, so that's a big blow. Top right shot defenseman. Um, you know, waiting for updates there. Uh, Artem Zub left the Wild. Uh, I know, not not the Wild, but the, the, the King. The Wild LA and Ottawa game today, which ended 8 7, which we're going to talk about here in a few minutes. Um, uh, Zub took a, a big hit from Tanner Janot, and to me, it looked like a concussion, like he got hit. And the, the, the hit was clean. Uh, it was a shoulder hit, but when he, he went down hard and it looked like his back of his head hit the ice, he did go off with the concussion spotters, and he didn't return. Um, so we don't know for sure. Uh, he's still being evaluated. Sometimes, you know, uh, things can look murky for a day or two, and then they clear up, and other times they can drag on. So we don't know. Uh, we don't know what's the case for Zub, but at this point I would bank on him being out for at least a little bit. Um, and Seattle Kraken defenseman Vince Dunn also was hurt last night and also expected to miss some time as well. Now another, uh, like I said, well let's, let's now jump to the Ottawa LA game since I mentioned it here uh, already. What a wild game that was today, eight to seven. Uh, that's like a converted touchdown with a two pointer, um, eight to seven. Like that was crazy. It was an early LA lead, two to nothing. Uh, they got two quick ones. Um, I think it was about. I can't remember the exact time in the first period, but there was, like I think, seven, eight minutes gone, something like that. And then they got the first one, then they got the second one, and it was 2 nothing early. Then before I know it, it was 2-1, then it was 3-1, 3-2, and then it just kept going. And I had to, uh, to leave to go out a little bit, so I missed a, a little bit of the game. And in the second period, it was just a major flurry. I come back, and bam, it's 5-5. Five, five. Like, it's just ridiculous. The amount, like, no defense going on. The goaltenders are not having a good day. And then after that, it became, it was like 6-5 LA, then 6-6. And then Ottawa goes up 7-6, and then, uh, which was their first lead of the day. And then the Kings tied it again, under five to go, 7-7. Goes to overtime. Josh Norris scores to make it 8-7. Just an absolutely ridiculous day. Uh, Darcy Kemper for the Los Angeles Kings was in that for all eight LA goals against. Uh, so that's not going to do him any favors with his stats. Not a good day for Darcy Kemper. The Ottawa Senators did muster 41 shots. Um, they did. It's funny because I know you look looking at it, you think the Senators had a horrible game. And to be honest, five on five, the Senators actually statistically were very much the better team. But um, both teams had good, strong special teams. Uh, the Kings had a few power play goals. They had a few that I know Forsberg started the game because Linus Allmark was. Um, he's not on IR or anything like that, but he was sitting out because of some stiffness and they wanted to give him some rest. And Forsberg goes in for his first start of the year and it didn't go well. Um, he allowed three goals and nine shots and got pulled. They had recalled this morning on emergency bases, Matt Sogard. Um, he comes up from Belleville. Now he played yesterday in Belleville in an overtime game. Um, and he obviously arrived in Ottawa with short notice and all that, but he went in for Forsberg after that and he gave up four goals and 17 shots so again subpar performance from both of the Sens goaltenders um most of those goals against should have never happened for the ones at least the ottawa goals on kemper not to let him off the hook because he still let in eight goals there was definitely some soft ones but i think more of them were higher quality better chances in my opinion so it was just it was a game of a lot of uh, not as much defense as you'd think especially considering LA normally pretty strong defensively, uh, and none of the goaltenders had good days at all. Um, it's the second time in NHL history that the uh, Senators allowed uh, scored seven goals while allowing seven in the same game. The other time it happened was against the Blackhawks, and they lost that one eight to seven. Back, I think it was 2021, I think it was, if I'm not mistaken. So yeah, pretty wild and crazy game there today. 15 goals in total. Um, yeah, so the Sens improved to two and one on the year, but they've got some things to clean up for sure. Now the other wild thing that happened today as well 
uh, the Buffalo Sabres actually had a fight in practice. And it was spurred on by a new captain, Rasmus Dahlin, completely out of character. This was really bizarre. Um, now, it's not really that crazy to see teammates have a little scuffle or fight in practice. It happens sometimes, especially during like a battle drill, heat of the moment, especially if there's any frustration built up, team's not doing well. Sometimes things can get a little overheated. It definitely happens. But basically, uh, they're on, on the drill that they're doing, Dahlin's defending. Peyton Krebs is coming in on a rush. And he just laid him out with a massive hip check, which is not something you normally ever see in practice because you don't want to hurt your teammates and you don't want to take it that far. Um, but after he laid the hip check, they both come up just to chuck on him and started throwing punches. So Darlene, to me, looked like the frustration was built up. Uh, he lays his teammate out and then like knew as soon as he did it that they were going to fight. So is there more to this? Um, I, know, I know Lindy Ruff kind of played it off after practice said that uh, it wasn't you know boys being boys basically and that uh you know uh, they want to have good hard competitive practices and that they've already moved past it and you know what i hope for their sake they have but the fact of the matter is this is that the buffalo sabers have started poorly this year um you know they're a one and three record uh, two of those losses came overseas to the New Jersey Devils and the Global Series. Uh, when you got teammates fighting, that just and with a brand new captain too, like he was just named captain a couple of weeks ago, um, it just seems like an uncaptainly like thing to do. Unless Krebs really did something that really upset him, and that he kind of deserved it, which I can't say that he did. Of course, we don't, you know, I don't have the full footage from practice to see what happened leading up to that if there was anything else that you could see that made sense to trigger it is there something goes on off the ice that we don't know um pretty crazy um so i don't i don't, I don't know what's going on there but there was also some other rumors today regarding the sabers and some massive changes that might come um sooner than later here so dave pagnon of the fourth period.com will connect at nhl insider um he was uh, a new article today they were saying that if the Sabres season gets off the rails here in the first month, and like I say they currently sit one and three, it seems pretty obvious that the the blue line is having trouble, not working, uh, not being as strong as they had hoped, and that the supporting cast up front is not quite getting the job done. That if, if the next probably, you know, they said within the next month, so we're probably talking the next, you know, eight to ten games. If things get off the rails and they end up, let's say they go like I don't know three and seven or you know, 4-11 or something like that to start the year. Uh, he's saying he's a pretty good chance that Kevin Adams isn't going to be the GM anymore. That the Sabres are already kind of thinking about this and that they already have somebody in mind to take over. So if they've already gotten to that point, uh, they obviously must see what I've been saying is that I don't think the team has improved enough. The last two off seasons, there has not been enough change. Um, they have a lot of good young players. There's no doubt. They've built a pretty decent nucleus there that they can build around, just like we've seen in Ottawa and Detroit. You know, you've got your captain now, Rasmus Dahlin. You've got Tage Thompson. You've got J.J. Paterka's turned out real good. Cousins is pretty good. You know, on the blue line, you also got Owen Power, Samuelson. Uh, you traded for Byram. Like, you know, these guys are all all really good, you know, potential players here that could be long-term fits there, Right. But it's a supporting cast. They don't have, I don't think, enough of that veteran leadership and enough of that, uh, you know, just secondary scoring and things like that, right? Like, look at the Senators, for example. You know, they added a lot of uh, older uh, experience NHL depth that have a history of winning. Like, everybody they added in the offseason has uh, pretty much every one of them, er, except for Allmark, who was... You know, one of Vezina Trophy is a top goaltender in the NHL very recently. And if you look at a lot of the breakdowns and his stats and goaltending the last two or three years, he's number one in a lot of them. So he's the exception here. But everybody else, they're like cup winners. You know, David Perron, Stanley Cup champion. Nick Jensen, Stanley Cup champion. Michael Amadio, Stanley Cup champion. So they, they've been through the grind. They now really know and understand what it takes to win. And I think the Sabres need more of that. I really do. So we'll see what happens here. But ultimately, if they've already got somebody in mind, then that, to me, spells trouble for Adams. Now, what Pagnano's report, though, did indicate that um, that Adams would likely stay in the organization and possibly go into a different role. 
So it doesn't mean he's going to be fired. He's worked with the Sabres a long time. He had other roles before becoming general manager. I know the Pagulas are quite fond of him. And I don't, I don't think they would completely fire him and, you know, just turf him completely from the organization. I think he'd end up being reassigned. And um, whoever they have as the next target that they've got uh, their eye on here could take over as the next general manager of the Buffalo Sabres. It could be very... Very interesting, and that will likely be followed by some, you know, some trades. I mean, I know um, that Casey Mills that trade. You know, ideally, and not the Byram is not looking good, but you know, Casey Mills that's a player that they need now, right? Um, lots of debate on Dylan Cousins: is he a center? Is he a winger? You know, Peyton Krebs came over as a centerpiece from Vegas in a trade for Eichel, and he hasn't quite worked out uh, the way they had hoped. So. You know, there's definitely going to be some some trades in in Buffalo, and you could see that first. Um, we'll see how much Adams decides to try to get ahead of this. But the Sabers definitely are going to be an interesting team to watch here. And if they don't uh, turn their season around, I know it's only four games, but like I said before, the you know, same thing goes for guys like Ottawa, Detroit. You can't win the Stanley Cup or qualify for the playoffs in October, November. But you can lose your right to fight for it easily during that time frame if you have a slow start. So we'll see. Uh, some other news regarding the Avalanche and Miko Rantanen also comes from Dave Pagnona of the fourth period.com, suggesting that the Rantanen contract is going to be very complicated to do and that it's likely going to come in on a very hefty number above Nathan McKinnon. McKinnon, of course, re-signed a couple seasons back for $12.6 million, just barely eclipsing Connor McDavid's uh, high salary at the time. Of course, you know, McDavid, and then, then you get McKinnon, and then Matthews came along after, and he topped it again. And you got to remember here, like with Rantanen, he was uh, experiencing, you know, some pretty significant production during his time there. And there, there was a period of time where he was higher paid than McKinnon but looking at McKinnon's uh, numbers you know when he signed he got 15 percent of the cap right so the cap's expected starting next year to be at 92 and a half million so 15 percent was well above 13 million that's like over 13 and a half million so that's like you know over a million dollars more than what McKinnon's getting paid now so he may not get 15 percent like McKinnon did but it probably wouldn't be a lot less so to, su to suggest that he could eclipse McKinnon's salary and be higher is not totally absurd. The problem is, and what some people are saying in the Avalanche and what Pagnon is saying is, do the Avalanche have the appetite to surpass McKinnon's salary with Mika Rantanen? They absolutely love this player, and they, I'm sure, don't want to lose him, but do they want to pay him that much money? So this Rantanen contract extension, I think it's going to be very fascinating to watch. And we're going to have to see. I mean, I have no doubt that the Avalanche right now are not thinking about making trades at all when it comes to this guy. They want to sign him. Um, so I don't see that happening. But it makes me wonder about the future. And if they can't get it done, well, how is it going to work out? It's going to be very interesting nonetheless. So the Rantanen uh, situation, very interesting. As I mentioned earlier, too, in Ottawa, they might have not have a choice <clears throat> but to go out and trade for a goaltender. What we've seen today with Sogard and Forsberg was subpar. Linus Allmark has been excellent so far. He's only played a couple of games, but they have to be able to win games when he's not in the lineup, and he can't play 82 games. So, you know, for, for Anton Forsberg, you know, the, he didn't have a great preseason, and then his first start, three goals and nine shots. Like, I could see a scenario like Billy Huso that they put Forsberg on waivers. Now, I'm not saying he's going to get picked up. He's making like three million bucks for this year. Then he's a pending UFA. Um, I don't. I don't see him being back in Ottawa next year, regardless. But I, they need better backup goaltending. And even if Forsberg didn't get picked up, and they put him through waivers, and they demoted him, the relief they would get from his contract being buried in the minors. They could take that money and you would think go acquire another backup goaltender that would give them something better. They don't need, you know, amazingness, but they need, you know, something close to league average. At least over 900 save percentage. And, you know, don't be shocked because the Sens, I don't think, are going to be overly patient this year. Uh, you know, they obviously did a lot. 
of uh, work in the off season. All of that work mostly is looking decent so far after three games. It's early yet, though, so some of that work is still being evaluated. But goaltending, they did fix it for sure with their starter. But, you know, Sogard proved today that he's he's not ready still. He needs more time. And, if, you know, if Sogard's not ready by next year, they're going to have to move on and start working on Marilyn and being the next guy. Um, but at this point, you know, Sogard and Forsberg just may not be it. And it's just that simple. So don't be shocked if Ottawa goes out and tries to find um, another backup goalie if they can find a way to move off of Forsberg, either through waivers or through trade with a little bit of retained money or something like that. And with Toronto, of course, we know Timothy Lilgren is a name to watch here. We've talked a lot, a lot about him lately, obviously been a hot topic. Uh, I did see an article today that uh, between what Dave Pagnona was saying in the fourth period and what the other article, which was from The Score, uh, talking about, uh, Pagnona was saying that uh, he believes that Lilgren would welcome a change of scenery. So at this point, you know, looks like Elliot Friedman was saying on the headlines there on Saturday, like it's not only at a point where the Leafs are trying to shop this guy, he's like, he's ready to go too. So like I said, there was some belief that the Leafs had given him permission to speak to other teams. Uh, Friedman said he believed that to be the case, but when uh, he reached out to the Leafs, they did deny it. So that doesn't mean it's 100% not true, but they certainly are not willing to put that out there publicly, even if it is. So we don't know that. But the other article suggested some landing spots for Lilgren that would make a lot of sense, and one was across Western Canada to, to Edmonton. Uh, Edmonton is certainly not... Their revamp D is uh, not playing up to snuff right now. Uh, to get a right shot defenseman who's younger, not making a huge, huge salary, might be a good possibility for them to upgrade. So Edmonton does make a lot of sense for Lilgren. Dallas makes sense. He would be kind of be maybe viewed as upon as an upgrade over a guy like uh, Nils Lundqvist that maybe play on their third pair. A team like LA right now with Drew Doughty being injured, and they have a lot of youth back there. So. You know, bring in a little bit somebody with a little more experience, but they do have a lot of internal pieces they might like better. Pittsburgh's another option as well. Um, Pittsburgh certainly, you know, uh, very familiar with this player with Kyle Dubas and Jason Spezza. You have to think that there would be some interest. Pittsburgh's blue line is not exactly super deep, um, and they, I mean, they have a lot on the left side with uh, with Grizzlick and Pedersen and uh, Graves. Carlson on the right side, they could they could benefit from another right defenseman. I think that uh, makes sense for a logical landing spot there. So we'll see what happens. But uh, with Lilgren starting to put a little pressure, I think, for the Leafs to move him, it uh, be interesting to see how it all plays out. So let me know your thoughts on all of today's news and rumors down in the comments. We'll discuss further. If you're new to the channel, of course, make sure you subscribe and stick around. Thanks for sticking with me here on my makeshift TSH Studios video for all of today's news and rumors. Thanks for watching, and I'll catch you next time.